Hello, everyone. Welcome to, to this evening's uh, class. It's called Stru uh, Class Structure in the United States. It's a Marxist analysis focused on small and large capitalists. It's part two of the National Marxist School Online. I hope you'll find this of interest. It's getting to know your class structure in the United States. My name is uh, Alvaro Rodriguez. I'm from Texas. I'm the district organizer here, for those of you who don't know me. And uh, I am. Uh, I have 40 years. Uh, I retired from the petrochemical industry. I worked in, in that industry for 40 years. So I got to know the class structure of the United States uh, in my work experience. And I also travel abroad uh, doing engineering, uh, troubleshooting, uh, technical problem solving. And uh, so I got to see the class structure in in uh, in in Europe and in, uh, in the Americas, in Asia, and so forth. So I, I do have a broad background uh, in the production area. This, this is a very profound statement that was my, made in the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels. Says the history of all here too existing society is a history of class struggles. So this is a very important statement because that is the key to change uh, sociological you know, transformation in our society. And it's, it has to do with the class struggles. So it's very fundamental to Marxists. And uh, yet there still seems to be a lot of uh, lack of understanding of the class structure and how important classes are in, in the existing society. As I am an engineer, I like to always uh, write down what the the terms that we're using so that we're all on the same page. So let's start with what is a class? Marx distinguished one class from another based on those that have ownership of the means of production and or distribution and purchase the labor power of others. And those that do not own means of production, workers have to sell their own labor power to live. So these are terms that maybe you may be familiar with or not. Uh, he doesn't use the, the term labor because it's, it's, the, it's the power to labor, the power to create surplus value from human labor that is at the core of the capitalist system. So again, uh, what is a class? Is a Marx, Marx distinguished one class from another based on those that have ownership of the means of production and purchase the labor power of others. And those that own no means of production, they have and they have to sell their labor power to live. Those are working class, and those are workers. If you primarily, if you live primarily from stocks, dividends, and other passive investments, you are probably a capitalist. That is, if you file, for instance, a 1099 instead of a W-2 form, or if 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 if, if you're uh, you live primarily from uh, dividends and uh, and capital gains, then you probably are a capitalist. So uh, let us, let's say capitalists live from the surplus value created by workers. So they're not, they're not independent classes. The capitalist is a parasitic class that lives off the surplus value created by workers. Why, and capitalists, when we talk about exploitation, we talk about capitalists that do, they're not, they are not paying workers a full day's work. That's what exploitation really is all about. It's not whether they uh, they pay in below prevailing wages. It's not that. It's it's the portion of the of the day's work that is not being paid. If you live, if you own a small business, small farm, you're self-employed. You go in and out of the working class. You're probably a lower strata of the capitalist class. You're a petty bourgeoisie or a small proprietor or what we call a small capitalist. This is a. a, a Marx described it as a different strata of the capitalist class, but it goes in and out of that class and, and it, it goes in into the capitalist class, but mostly it goes into the working class because most small businesses fail. Uh, they fail, 75% of small businesses fail within 10 years. So did people think that Karl Marx invented the idea of classes and class struggle. He did not. Uh, but Marx understood that the class struggles was the driving force of history as I mentioned earlier uh, from the Communist Manifesto. Marx identified historical change as an expression of the class struggle. So that the class struggle results in, in historical change. Uh, 
but in this class struggle, we, we have to decide what side are we on. That's what the unions usually say, what side are you on? We must not waffle on this issue, not if we want socialism. So we always want to stay on the working class side of this struggle. And, uh, and we should be partisans to the working class. And that's what identifies us ideologically. There are two main ideas that I want to share with you today. Know the existing ruling class in order to win the struggle for real democracy, winning working class rule, socialism. So this is how we define socialism, is winning working class rule. Uh, it's nothing more than that. It's a transitional phase between capitalism and communism. And, uh, and we're not going to go into that today, but uh, that is, that's the definition. Knowing and using internal contradictions within the ruling class are required to achieve revolutionary change. So you need to understand first the class, that there's a class struggle going on, there's what a class is, and then how are you going to you know, set up a program? Uh, how do you set up a, a plan of work to, to, uh, to impact uh, change, historical change? Let's go over some basics uh, in case uh, you missed some of the classes earlier on. So let's talk about some of the basic classes and, uh, and the production modes, and they're different things. So for instance, there's, uh, there's classes uh, of slaves and slave owners. This is under the slavery mode of production. There's serfs and land owners under the feudalist, uh, feudalism uh, mode of production. And it's called different things in different countries. In Mexico, I think they call it uh, they call it uh, latifundismo, or sometimes they call it pionismo. It's called different things, but it's the same same basic concept. They have workers and capitalists under capitalism, and capitalism is a mode of production. And then under communism, you have no classes. And remember, socialism falls in. It's a transition form between capitalism and communism. So what is the working class? I think we went over that somewhat, but we need to go over it again. People who sell their labor power in order to live, that is the working class. All who live from paid wages or salaries, blue collar, white collar, no collar, are hourly or salary, manual or professional workers, contract or permanent. The capitalist class, first of all, they deny there's such a thing as classes in our society. And then they try to divide us along uh, educational uh, levels uh, you know, between uh, contract employees versus permanent employees, manual workers versus uh, workers that do mainly uh, office work. They try to divide us whether we're, we received hourly wages or we receive salaries. Uh, so that is that's, that's all the ruling class trying to divide us. But all of all, in, if you receive wages or salaries, if you have to go to work to live, then you, you are a member of the working class. So what is the capitalist class though? It's a small group that steals the unpaid labor of the working class. If you live primarily from dividends or capital gains, you're likely a capitalist. So I don't think there's any question about that. What about the ruling class? We use the term ruling class sometimes and we mix it up with the capitalist class. But actually the ruling class is a smaller section of the capitalist class that dictates public policy. They, that is, they're in and out of government. Out of, they're, they're involved in making state policy. It's a tiny group that privately makes all the major, it privately makes all the major public policy decisions that run our lives. This tiny group substitutes themselves for majority rule democracy. So this is a dictatorial group and it's a rather small group as I will show later on, but they're the ones making all the decisions. It's not the public as, as this, the myth that spread around. This is a depiction that I created. It's a, uh, of a class pyramid. And uh, at the very top of the pyramid is a capitalist ruling class. These are capitalists that make policy decisions plus the state oligarchy. And uh, by one estimate, it's approximately 44,000. We're not gonna get exact numbers because the ruling class doesn't want anybody to, to know there's such a thing as a ruling class. They, they prefer not to discuss it except in movies. Uh, they they conflate uh, the, the ruling class with the uh, 
with the upper class, with the upper income class. Even the American Sociological Association says that the that the that the uh, uh, upper class in this country constitutes somewhere between one to two percent of the population. That's a lot of people, and that's not the case. If you look at the total population of the United States, there's 335 million people. One to two percent of the population is somewhere between uh, between three and six million people. That's that's not the case. People that were seriously looked at this before estimated they can all the ruling class in the United States can fit inside Yankee Stadium. So it's not a very big bunch. What about the capitalist class? Uh, again, there's also no no official sources of information on what the capitalist class, the size of the, of the capitalist class, people that live off their dividends, capital gains. You would think that the IRS would, would show that information, but they've only illustrated 23,000 households that have more than $2 million, report more than $2 million, mostly in business and investment income. So that, that would be one way to classify the capitalist class somewhere in that region of 20, about 23,000 households. Uh, how, how about the petty bourgeoisie strata of the capitalist class? These are small business owners, self-employed, small farmers. The Small Business Administration says there's about 33 million of them, and, and we're going to go into that in more detail. Uh, but th take a look at that. That's that that's that part of the upper part of the pyramid compared to the working class. The working class there's about 200 million workers, and uh, but does not include uh, stay-at-home moms and dads, unpaid caregivers, retirees, students, and the young. Uh, so the uh, working class, including working class families, that that is the overwhelming majority of the population in the United States. This uh, this nice uh, chart here comes from Forbes, and there are no there are no partisan of the working class, and they showing that this and this is data from the Small Business Administration it says there's about 33.2 million small businesses across the USA. But the important thing from this chart to, to look at this, this pie chart is that 27 million have no employees. So 27 out of the 33 million small businesses across the United States have no employees. So this is mom and pop stores, uh, people working on their own in, the, in, their, in their small restaurants and retail businesses, uh, Uber drivers and so forth. So eight out of 10 small businesses have no employees is the way they put it in this graph. Um, now look at the, uh, there's 5 million that have between one and 19 employees. There's 5 million of these businesses, small businesses. But you, you'll find out that many, many of those employees, they're, they're family members. Uh, so there's a tiny group of, uh, of employers capitalists that have more than 20 employees, uh, 650,000 of them. Uh, you'll find out there's much, they're much smaller than that. Um, but anyway, this gives you a good idea, uh, a picture of, of the small businesses. Remember the, the, uh, the Republican Party uh, and Ronald Reagan and others, they all made a big fetish of protecting small business and, and farms, small farms. Well, uh, you'll find out that they're a very tiny percentage of the population. Many of what these small businesses are, they're, they're huge agribusinesses that get subsidized, uh, subsidized, you know, a lot of public subsidies for making ethanol and so forth. So let's review the two main ideas that we set out initially. We need to know the ruling class in order to win the struggle for real democracy, winning working class rule. And secondly, knowing and using internal contradictions within the ruling class are required to achieve revolutionary change. This is very important that we understand the class structure of the United States in order to do this, in order to have a plan as to how do we best uh, effect change in this country. So I think, uh, Molly, I think at this point, I, I will turn it over to you for uh, to gather any questions, comments.
OK, so we're going to open up the discussion and uh, we'll take all comments and questions um, before returning it to uh, Alvaro to respond. So I am looking for raised hands. Nolan McDonald. Um, so I've been reading about like lumpen proletariats and I was wondering is like where do they fit on the pyramid that was shown? Thank you. Mohsin Sadiq, your mic is open. Hi, hello, comrade. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would do address the issue of what is the role of the Communist Party vis-a-vis -vis the working class and how, how that works. And, and then you should talk about it a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Isaiah Miller. Uh, so my question was in regards to when you're talking to other people, uh, I don't like to use the terms uh, like capitalist or working class because that kind of has a lot of negative connotations in people's mind. Like when you say capitalist, they're thinking of mom and pop along with maybe the big monopolists. Uh, and when you say working class, they tend to think of uh, l lower end proletarians as opposed to the working class as a whole. Um, so what's a good way to kind of explain that concept to people without, I guess, calling to mind those uh, maybe uh, flawed ideas that they might have uh, about those um, groups. Thank you. Molly, maybe we can turn it back to Alvaro now and then ask, after Alvaro responds, ask again whether or not there are any more comments or questions, okay? Sounds good. Go ahead, Alvaro. Okay, uh, let me give it a shot. Uh, I hope others will provide even better answers than I can provide. What about the lumpen proletariat? Uh, well, the lumpen proletariat is, uh, is those that are declassed workers uh, due to uh, a lot of factors, uh, addictions, uh, drugs, uh, um, criminality, and so forth. I, 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 I'm not going to give ever give a, a a broad enough discussion of this area, but usually they're in and out of the working class. And uh, uh, I know that there's, this has been brought up in the past that maybe they're more revolutionary because they're even poorer. Uh, that that it, we, we found out from experience that they're not a reli very reliable ally of the working class. But I, I, I did not put them in there because they're, they're not a significant number to begin with. And, uh, um, but we do need to think a little bit harder about what, what do we do with the lump of proletariat. I think the second question was, what is the role of the Communist Party within the working class struggle? If, if I understood that correctly. I think that the, uh, I mentioned there's over 200 million workers uh, in this country. That includes agricultural workers and, and uh, civilian employees and others. That this data from the small, no, it's data from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, you say, well, with 200 million plus their families, uh, and that's the overwhelming majority of the population of almost 333 million people. Why is the ruling? Why is is the working class not the ruling class in this country? Why? Why? Why not? And, and the answer to that is because they're they have uh, they're divided. The, uh, first of all, there's a lack of uh, revolutionary consciousness in the working class. There's even uh, I think Lennon mentioned that that uh, trade union consciousness was was almost automatic, in, in it, and it's not in this country because the ruling class has hit collective bargaining rights very hard and try to keep people from unionizing it. Uh, so even working class uh, union consciousness is is hard to uh, hard to find. Certainly here in Texas, it's very difficult to. It's only what about five or six percent of the uh, of the workers are unionized. So think about that. Uh, the uh, the ruling class hates unions because it's a basic organization of the working class that can become very powerful. They particularly hate the teachers unions because they're the largest unions in the country. And uh, they, they don't like that. And uh, so that, that is, that's why this, this huge force 
this labor force of over 200 million people plus their families is not able to rule because they're not only divided uh, in terms of consciousness, but they're also divided along color, they're divided uh, ge along gender lines and so forth. So the, what is the role of the Communist Party? The role of the Communist Party is to raise revolutionary consciousness in the working class in a, in a smart way. Obviously, uh, we, we have to be, we have to understand where workers are at and, and be involved in the struggles. That's when people learn the best, when they're involved in struggle. And uh, in the Communist Party, what it does bring in is, is this revolutionary consciousness, brings in this, uh, this experience of struggle into the working class. And, and it, it raises the uh, issue of, of, of consciousness, uh, raising uh, revolutionary consciousness while being active in winning struggles for change that alleviate the, uh, uh, the exploitation and, and the uh, conditions of the working class. Uh, the Communist Party is battle is to win the respect of workers to be uh, to be able to provide a vanguard role in the working class to become a representative, becoming a working class party and representative of the working class in this change to a socialist society. Uh, that is something that's not automatic. It has to be gained and won in, in, in the streets, in, in the class struggle. Uh, so that's the role of, of, of the, uh, this, the Communist Party would be the, the political party of the working class. Uh, that's what the objective is. Uh, Miller talked about uh, what is the best way to talk to people about the class, the classes and class struggle. Well, I don't know that I, uh, that I have the best way to do it other than we can talk about working people. People are so, they, they, people know. Uh, the, the, Yes, small business people, they're working people too. They work very hard, especially small business work very hard. The only difference between small business people in the working class is that small business people, many small business people, not all, uh, they, uh, they ha some have illusions of becoming part of the capitalist class. Uh, and uh, so their revolutionary, co their consciousness is quite low. Uh, Again, there's exceptions to all of these cases. Take Ingalls. Ingalls came from a wealthy uh, family of textile industry in Germany, and and he became one of the founders of of, of you know and one of the writers of the Mar uh, Communist Manifesto, one of the most famous texts in in, in history. Uh, but you you have to be smart as to how to best best to to. Uh, to do this, uh, I think that you, you, there's no formulas because different people are at different levels of understanding and different experiences, life experiences. So, but I think that the way we talk to each other as Marxists, we have to have our own uh, science, socialist, scientific socialist uh, terminology so that we understand each other. But that's not necessarily the, the language you would use in talking to, to workers that, that, that are not familiar with that science. You would have to use words that convey the struggle, but you have to know what side of the struggle you're on. Uh, if you think that there's a, this is, I'm sidetracking a little bit because this is, a, this is an interesting question that came up in one of our study sessions. There was a young man that said that the communists were, were all wrong about classes because these 3D printers will now become the production sources. So people will be able to print every, all the products they need at home with 3D printers. And I, I, I told them that I wish we had the time to go and look at the uh, ship channel uh, in Houston and look at the petrochemical industry and see how soon do you think we can uh, fabricate all that in a 3D printer? Well, it's, uh, class is going to be around for a very long time. And uh, in spite of everything you hear of all the hype about uh, 3D printers or, uh, or, or in, you know, artificial intelligence and so forth, it's, it's, I, I blew up the uh, 
artificial intelligence programs, when I ask them a basic question, like what is the size of the uh, ruling class in this country? He doesn't know how to answer that because they can only answer from what's already been published in literature. Who do you think is writing all that literature? It's the uh, legal sociologist, and they're not allowed to talk about class struggle or even about a Marxist sense of, of the class struggle or, or classes. So, um, but to answer uh, your question, uh, you you would have to talk with people in in the in 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 as simple a, a language as you can, about whether or not they uh, they work for a living uh, versus those that they're the idle few that you know. Do you think that the that the Walton family actually works real hard? No, they do not. Um, a lot of these other people don't they don't they don't hardly work at all, but. It's not a question whether they work. It, it, it's more of a question is where do they make most of their living? I used to work in the petrochemical industry and the CEO of the company says he got a paycheck of $800,000. That's a lot of money. Nevertheless, if that was the, that's all he earned, then you would say, well, maybe he's just a high level executive and works very hard and he, he deserves the $800,000 a year. But that was not his, you have to go back and look at, at the report that was issued by the corporation to the Securities and Exchange Commission to see what the real compensation was, which was somewhere in the, between 24 million, somewhere in there. So this was, he was paid, given a paycheck, but he was also given stock options. So his basic, most of his money came from selling stock that was given to him by the corporation at rather low price and then selling it at high price. Now I included, uh, just as a side remark, I included a distribution uh, as, as, as uh, not only means of production, but also distribution. Because so I was trying to account, for instance, where do you put uh, Amazon and where do you put uh, Walmart in here in terms of the corporations? They really don't have, means they don't, they're not involved directly in the production process. They are involved more in the distribution process. They make their money by, somehow buying uh, products produced by workers elsewhere, buying them cheap and selling them higher and making, and making their money off the difference in pricing. Uh, so as somebody said, uh, theory is gray, but life is evergreen. So life is much more complicated than anything, any the simplistic uh, models that we create in our brain. But uh, I think that this is a good question. You know, is, is to we need to learn how to explain some of this uh, concepts such as class in a way that uh, people will uh, uh, everyone can understand that's all i had molly you want to take another round of questions yes thank you all right the floor is open nolan i see your a hand raised your mic is open um so like i've been trying to get involved for a long time and I was like wondering, so is there like youth programs for CPUSA? Thank you. Um, we have young communists, uh, and we're organizing young communists in the CPUSA. And uh, we, we used to have a, a young communist league. It, uh, and, and we still have some formations like that in universities and in some of the uh, cities. And uh, so it's 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 information. So YCL is information, uh, but it's part of the uh, Communist Party uh, clubs, and in, in, in it acts under the guidance of the Communist Party clubs. Um, I would encourage you to uh, to recruit other young people into the movement for socialism, into the CPUSA, and then you can uh, work with the clubs to uh, form a youth component uh, of the clubs. Uh, and coordinate with the National uh, Youth Collective. Alvaro, the only thing I would add to that is um, to invite you to, uh, Nolan, to uh, email membership at cpusa.org. Um, it's possible that your membership application um, got misplaced. So if you reach out to membership at cpusa.org, they'll be able to assist you in finding your club organizer. All right, uh, Alvaro, do you have any final comments to close out the class? 
Well, let me, let me just say that, uh, again, uh, class, understanding class, this class structure and composition of the United States is very important in our plan to, to impact, to work for socialism in this country. We must understand what are the forces against the working class. We, understand, we need to understand what they are, and they're not monolithic. That is, they don't all think the same. So while it appears that way because of the corporate ownership of the means of manipulation, uh, it, it almost sounds like they're always thinking about the same this in the same way, but they're, they're not. There's some differences. Mainly the differences, it's not so much economic, there are differences on uh, social issues. So they're not a one mind on the issue of abortion. They're not a one mind on the issue of elections. Uh, there are, a, a set of ruling class capitalists that that are short-term capitalists. They want to make money, a lot of money right now. And there are some longer-term capitalists that want to look after the interest of the capitalist class in the long term. So they want to make sure they they keep the pitchforks away. And uh, so they, they're the ones that talk about inclusive capitalism. They're trying to make it look nicer because they're trying to safeguard the capitalist system. Uh, so there, there's there's some differences between them, and it's our responsibility to uh, find those differences and 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 use those differences to perpetuate uh, our our program to put forth our working class program. So uh, think think very hard about this uh, the class issue, uh, make it a fundamental part of your ideological development. Uh, never always look at whenever any question comes up you always have to see what side of the class divide are we really talking about and, and we're partisan we're we're, we're not uh, we're not academics uh, appear to be partisan impartial we're not we're, we're partisans of the working class and we always will be because we're looking for a socialist future and uh and every uh, every activist, every communist, every socialist needs to work very hard to make sure they're on the right side of the class struggle. That's it, Molly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Alvaro. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I hope you will join us on Saturday. Saturday morning, we'll, we'll do a little deeper dive into uh, segments of uh, special uh, segments of the working class and Saturday afternoon, we'll uh, talk about common uh, traits and characteristics of working class people. So thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you will find a little time to get some rest uh, for the rest of your evening and we hope uh, you'll be able to join us on Saturday. Once again, Thank you, uh, Alvaro. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Eric. And good night. Thank you, everyone.